not be familiar, um, this gentleman here is one James Sedanius, or also known as Jim Sedanius. Jim Sedanius is one of the foundational thinkers um, in what we would identify as black male studies, but somewhat retroactively. He came out with work a good deal of time, a good period of time ago that we, in many ways, appreciate that, Lloyd. Thank you very much. Um, oh, really? Crying because they let him out, huh? Oh, interesting. Oh. Afro Nerd, what's going on? Dr. Thunder, what's the word, man? Good to see both of you guys up in here. Uh, Barry, what's happening? All right. Getting some people in here. Uh, Lorenzo says, research cervical decompression, regular stretching of your neck and muscles. That's what they did today, but I will definitely look into that. Thank you, Lorenzo. All right. So, Jim Sedanius, foundational thinker, social dominance theory. We're going to talk a little bit about that and his contributions to what would later be known as black male studies. Um, and I was introduced to Sedanius's work. Uh, at least I thought I was introduced to Sedanius through Dr. Tommy Curry. Shout out to him. Um, what I what I found out, however, is I do remember when um, Sedanius actually came to the Claremont Colleges when I was there in graduate school. I didn't know who he was. And at the time, I didn't think I was studying gender, meaning I was studying gender as it related to my coursework, but I had not embraced it in terms of my own research. Um, not really. So when he came, um, I regretfully, I watched the lecture, but I didn't record it. You know what I mean? I didn't, it, 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 it's like, you know, it, I don't know how else to put it. it. It would be like if you got to see somebody who's going to be significant to your life 25 years later, but you didn't know it. You know what I mean? Um, it was one of those kind of things. So I saw him and um, he, had like, he had like two young Caucasian women assistants and he was up there ripping intersectionality. And I was like, who is this dude? Like, what is, you know, he looked kind of nerdy. I didn't know what to make of it, but, you know, um, I come back full circle, you know, uh, probably about three years ago, three, four years ago. And, um, you know, Tommy is sending me a couple articles. He's like, look, read this. You got to check this out. I'm like, all right. So I started going through it and I'm like, damn, who the hell is dropping all of this? And it took me a while to not only reconcile what the weight of his work meant, but also, what it meant to have been introduced to him before and not realized it. So that was one of the advantages of the Claremont colleges. You had all kind of people that would come speak because, you know, for the most part, they were fairly elite, posh, you know, white schools. So, you know, you get the best of the best, as they say, that would come speak there. But I really, I didn't appreciate the weight of his presence until much later. Sad to say, however, just got this news today as I understand it, it just happened today that Dr. Sedanius has passed away. So if you can look at him on Wikipedia, you can see he's born December 11, 1945, passed away June 30th, 2021. So shout out to this brother to the legacy of his work, which we will keep alive in black male studies uh, because it is, you know, incredibly relevant, incredibly important. And he lays an imperialist, uh, I mean, imperialist, excuse me, <laughs> imperialist. He lays, um, you know, a foundational empiricism to his approach to studying human behavior. But I still haven't found out the cause of death as of yet. Um, I did see an obituary, but it was weird. It was it, it was so many advertisements that on it that every time I scrolled to the portion where it went into his life, uh, it would just give me a wall of new advertisements. So I didn't get to actually find out what he passed of and what the issue was, but it, it blew me away. And he passed away today. So shout out to Dr. Sedanius. And I'm going to cover just a small portion of um, some of his work right now, just to kind of point out to you why he was important. You know, now I'm going to um, read this. I know it's probably a little too small um, to put on screen. So I think it might be best if, well, let me see. I'll try and get it on screen, see if I can. Yeah, there we go. All right. So basically, you know, um, James H. Sedanius, professor of psychology, UCLA, right? And um, he writes, social dominance theories identifies three distinct yet interrelated systems of group-based social hierarchy 
these systems are based upon the distinctions of A, A, age, B, gender, and C, what we call arbitrary sets. Arbitrary sets are highly flexible and situationally contingent social constructions of group membership. Examples of such arbitrary sets are distinctions based on citizenship, social class, race, ethnicity, clan, lineage, caste, region, etc. Using survey, archival, and experimental data dealing with both gender and ethnic discrimination across several cultures, and framing this data in terms of ideas taken from evolutionary psychology, this talk, this is the talk I got this from, will argue that one, while gender and ethnic discrimination share a number of features in common, these social phenomena are driven by qualitatively different motives and serve distinctly different social functions. Now, hold on. I want to emphasize something a little bit right there. So one of the important things that, that Sedanius did against the, 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 the current, against the stream, against the trends going on in the academy, this is a black male that actually began to argue against some of the things taken for granted um, uh, about the Appreciate that, Night King. Thank you very much. About the nature of race, gender, and so on and so forth, he actually argued that despite the common practice of suggesting that all of these are similar categories that come out of similar circumstances, that they're actually qualitatively different, right? That took a, a great deal of courage because, you know, and, and to this day, the current screen, the current trend is to use them almost interchangeably. And this is one of the, the, uh, the fallouts of intersectionality, right? That we, that race, class, sex, gender are, are damn near interchangeable. That, now that's not to say that that's necessarily what Crenshaw was arguing, but it is to say that is how it's been used. It, they become interchangeable categories. So Sedanius gives us a framework that suggests, nope, these are actually different categories and they have different purposes or at least stem from different contexts. So let's continue. So um, number two, right? Psychology of gender is incomplete without the inclusion of the psychology of arbitrary set hierarchy, specifically regarding invariant gender differences with respect to the predisposition to establish and maintain group-based social hierarchy. Likewise, complete understanding of the psychology of arbitrary set discrimination is incomplete without an understanding of the gendered nature of ethnic and racial discrimination. Okay. Eh, come on, come on. There we go. All right. And number three, and this is the this is the one that I'm uh, I really want to highlight here. The very popular double jeopardy hypothesis argues that women of color suffer from a double handicap and are discriminated against on the basis of both their gender and their ethnicity. However, this presentation it's argues. OK, uh, thanks for the support, Jay Rizzle. Appreciate that. Um, he says this presentation argues that uh, this popular thesis is fundamentally flawed. So when he's talking about double jeopardy, right, this is something that we've known more so as intersectionality, but the argument that, you know, at the end of the day, there's a double handicap. There are multiple issues stacked upon each other based on one's identity, right? And he says, in its place, we substitute the subordinate male target hypothesis, SMTH. SMTH argues that while women from both dominant and subordinate arbitrary groups for example, different races as one example of arbitrary groups are discriminated against on the basis of gender. Women from subordinate, subordinate arbitrary set groups are gener generally, excuse me, not directly discriminated against on the basis of their arbitrary group membership. Say again, race. Rather, arbitrary set discrimination, racial discrimination as an example, is primarily directed against males from sub subordinate arbitrary sets. More broadly, Social dominance theory suggests that arbitrary set discrimination should be regarded as a form of intergroup conflict and a largely male on male project. Such conflict is primarily executed by males and primarily targeted against outgroup males rather than outgroup females. That is powerful. That is powerful. So in a very common tongue, all he's basically saying is that if you're going to talk about racism, if you're going to talk about white supremacy, if you're going to talk about racial aggression, discrimination, oppression, the target is generally males. If you're talking about one group attacking, dominating, you know, whether it's 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 whether it's colonialism, whether it's enslavement, it's usually a project initiated by males, right, in the in group, and it's targeted 
at the outgroup males, the males that tend to suffer the impression, the oppression. Right. So, and he's basing this argument not strictly on the history of African Americans during slavery and so on and so forth. He's arguing this after having done multiple tests about the nature of human behavior. He's arguing that this tends to be the case across context. So it doesn't necessarily have to be African Americans and Europeans or Africans in particular. And he's saying that when you have one group dominate another, right, militaristically, physically, so on and so forth, on a macro level, not just you know an individual. He's saying that basically what you tend to have is a male on male dynamic. And although women are present and they definitely feel the impact of some of this, they are not the primary target. So what would be one of the most clear cut examples of that in the contemporary moment as it relates to black America? Well, y'all have heard me talk about this all the time. This is a perfect example. Let's look at police homicide. Right? This is one of the issues that's been in the news. Right? If we look at the numbers in regard to police homicide, let's see what Sidanius was talking about, because we have a, a number of different arbitrary sets. We can use race. We can use uh, we can use sex. We can use sexuality. You know, we can use gender. We can use, you know, sex and sexuality. I mean, the same thing. But nevertheless, you can use all of these different categories in the context of police homicide in the black community as initiated right, by the police, whether they be white or otherwise. We saw with the Derek Chauvin case, there were there were multiple police officers. They weren't all white. So the police initiating violence or uh, against or homicide, I should say, against African-Americans. Let's look at the numbers. Well, we know that two to three hundred of those killed by the police are black males. About nine to 13 are black females. Right? I reported on a, a study that came out of UCLA last year that tried to examine police homicide on the basis of sexuality. And one of the things they talked about in, re in relation to trans deaths was that roughly speaking, you had a black trans or trans person in general killed every other year. That was the basic breakdown of the number of trans. And the difficulty there too, especially when you're talking about black trans, is if you have uh, a female to male trans person, they're I, visibly identified with being male. So when you talk about police homicide against black men, they kind of fall into that category. If you're talking about a, a, a male to female trans person, the numbers for them being killed by police officers is extremely low. And realistically, the numbers for women being killed by black, black women being killed by police, police officers is particularly low. Why? It's not necessarily because white men have a love for black women, but part and parcel to Western culture there is a generic idea of chivalry in place to some extent, but to another extent, and I think this is what Sidanius was pointing to, males are primarily fixated on dealing with other males. This is why black males find themselves being the most harassed, the most um, killed, most subject to homicide by instruments of the state. Hell, we've 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 inherited that model to such a degree that even within the community, when you talk about homicides, intra-racial homicides within the community itself, black men are killing black men, and these are and these are mostly environmental issues. You start dealing with poverty, you start dealing with drugs, you start dealing with these kind of dynamics, but it still tends to be male, male. Even if you look at the top ten causes of death, men find themselves at the top of that. So my point simply being that what Sidanius was arguing. When he talked about arbitrary set discrimination, when he talked about SMTH, he basically was pointing out that it tends to be a male on male endeavor. And when you overlook that and you try to make it an everybody endeavor, what you end up doing is washing out, watering down the reality of what's going on. Shout out to Dr. Sedanius. Um, you know, his work will definitely live on another generation of scholars, um, particularly young black male scholars or scholars who are doing the work of studying the lives of black men uh, from a place of honesty and from a place of um, you know, um, integrity in regard to the realities of black male life. Um, he will be remembered, if in no other way, in the work he's brought to bear. So thank you for your sacrifice, sir. Um, I hope the ancestors are pleased. And um, Blessings to your family. Right.